subcommittee will come to order. We will do uh, opening statements from um, the chair and from the ranking member and then get right to our, uh, our great panels. Uh, today's hearing continues this committee's effort to expose cumbersome regulations that are stifling private sector job creation and a full economic recovery. For more than two years, the administration has told the American people that a trillion dollars of government spending was needed to put people back to work. The signature effort, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, was supposed to keep unemployment below 8 percent, but obviously it is not there. Two years later and a trillion dollars later, unemployment is hovering just above 9 and has reached as high as 10.1 percent since the President took office. In the State that both I and the ranking member come from, it is even, frankly, slightly higher. This situation looks even bleaker when you start looking at the economy sector by sector. Perhaps most telling are the statistics from the construction sector, which is, of course, our focus today. This important part of our economy encompasses ex ex excavators, pavers, plumbers, bricklayers, roofers, and a host of other contractors and some contractors on both residential and commercial projects. It includes architects, engineers, surveyors, and skilled craftsmen of every sort who design and construct America's infrastructure. For these millions of Americans, the unemployment rate is currently 21.8 percent, nearly two and a half times the total U.S. Un unemployment rate. No other sector of the economy has been hit harder by the economic downturn, and no other sector was supposed to benefit more from the so-called stimulus. Last December, when Chairman Issa requested direct feedback from job creators across the entire economy, many employers in the construction industry were candid with the committee about the Federal rules that keep them from growing their businesses, hiring new workers, and competing in a fair and open market. Among the many responses the committee received, two specific areas stand out. First, every day in the United States, job creators are in, the, in the construction industry are faced with the reality of project labor agreements. These agreements tip the scale of an open bid process in favor of organized labor and shut out nonunion shops, many of which are minority-owned and women-owned small businesses. In fact, the vast majority of U.S. construction workforce, nearly 87 percent, is nonunionized. Moreover, the cost of business increases dramatically because of PLAs. Several recent studies have found that these agreements add as much as 18 percent to the cost of construction. It wasn't surprising that when the President issued an executive order barely two weeks into his administration encouraging a preference for PLAs and government contracts, when you calculate the total amount of, of dollars in stimulus spending that is going to construction projects and tack on 18 percent for the cost of PLAs, the extra cash that went into the pockets of these uh, organizations is just not what the taxpayers want. Second, the committee has heard from job creators that proposed workplace rules by the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration that threaten to impede economic growth in the construction industry. Fortunately, and I want to, I want to compliment OSHA, they withdrew the proposed rules regarding occupational noise and work-related physical disorders after input from people who would have been most burdened by these rules. Meanwhile, other rules like OSHA's Injury and Illness Prevention Pro Program indicate that the administration has yet to comprehend how new layers of regulation can slow and even stop a full-scale revitalization of our Nation's construction industry. Make no mistake about it, workplace safety is a priority concern. America has built the most successful, robust, and profitable market economy in the world, and we have done so with an unapologetic commitment to worker safety. Safety and success are not mutually exclusive in the United States. But job creators are concerned about the trend at the Federal regulatory agencies that seem to be moving away from compliance assistance model toward an enforcement and penalization model. And this is critical as we move forward. Effective regulation does not require a threatening adversarial relationship between the government and the industries it monitors. This hearing will continue the important dialogue between private sector job creators, Congress, and the administration about the steps necessary to foster economic recovery that puts America back to work. The testimony we hear today from the front lines of the major sector of our domestic workforce will help us toward that goal. The Oversight Committee is one place in Washington where the government listens to the people and tells the truth about policies that aren't working. I welcome our witnesses and would now be happy to yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I listened with great interest to your opening statement. And, uh, you know, I had some misgivings about the uh, Recovery Act, but mine were on the other side. I felt it wasn't enough. Uh, I felt that uh, especially, and in a way you proved it by citing the 21.8 percent of unemployment among uh, these various tradespeople, um, I, I saw the battle going on on our side of the aisle where people like Jim Oberstar tried to get highway funds released for shovel-ready projects that could have put people back to work, and the administration uh, didn't, uh, wasn't particularly sympathetic to his point of view. And so I think that uh, we have to remember that only a quarter of the money that was spent on, uh, rather a fraction of the money that went for the uh, Recovery Act went actually for infrastructure and the kind of jobs that we are talking about here. Uh, as far as PLAs, um, where I come from, they equate to 
higher safety standards, higher craftsmanship, reliability. I mean, in short, you don't, you don't want public projects built by fly-by-night contractors who aren't into craftsmanship and safety, so you don't have bridges and falling down in schools, falling apart. Um, I have a prepared statement. I will just read, read a couple notes from it. Um, I hope that, like other meetings we have, today's discussion doesn't focus simply on the cost of regulation industry, because in order to have a truly productive conversation about regulations that yield real results, costs have to be weighed against benefits. When we hear industry's concern about PLA, let us not ignore the evidence that shows PLAs not only facilitate a timely and efficient construction project, but they can also reinvigorate a community by employing local craftsmen, educating young apprentices, and paying competitive wages. The arguments against PLAs that I have been hearing, that PLAs are exclusionary and costly, are not convincing. So I am looking forward to addressing these concerns with the witnesses. I think it is very timely uh, that we are talking about OSHA as well, because we are going to mark the 100th anniversary uh, next uh, week of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. That was a workplace disaster that took the lives of 146 workers because the factory failed to provide workers with any kind of basic workplace safety plan or provisions. So I, I have uh, going to ask unanimous consent to have the rest of my statement go on the record. But I, I think, Mr. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the whole idea um, about PLAs, project labor agreements, it actually brings together people who management and, and labor, so you can actually have a successful project. And I think that's a, I think that's a model that we ought to be supporting. Uh, and when we look at those who want to attack it because they are concerned about higher wages, um, it's, it's interesting, but I will bet you more often than not, that is never reflected in the lower cost of the project. What they, what they really end up arguing about is trying to get a bigger share of their profits for the corporation and not for the workers. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, uh, thank the ranking member. And without objection, is, uh, the rest of his statement will be entered into the record. Members have seven days to submit opening statements. And I would just, just in response to the, my good friend from uh, Ohio, um, I think he's right. I mean, we're going to have a debate about PLAs and the impact. Uh, I, I, I get that, but I would make make two points: um, non-union construction uh, companies aren't fly-by-night companies. They're good. They're good companies as well, and we don't want to disparage either one. I, I would agree with that. I, I would agree with that. And, and then, second, I would say uh, the member makes a good point. Um, the stimulus was way too much of spending everywhere and not enough focus spending on infrastructure. I would agree with that. I mean, I, I was against it and it was, you know, against it for a variety of reasons, but I, I would agree with the gentleman that um, certainly if you were going to spend that money, it would have been better spent had it been put more into infrastructure than, than all the other things it was, it was spent on. Right, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, the gentleman. Uh, we will ask now for our witnesses to come forward and we will get, we'll get started. Our first panel, we have, uh, first of all, Mr. John Innes uh, is the CEO of Innes Electric Company. Welcome to the committee. Ms. Ms. Linda Figg is the CEO of Figg Engineering. Uh, professor uh, Dale Bellman, uh, Dr. Bellman, is a professor at the School of Labor and Industrial Relations at Michigan State University. Mr. John Biagas is the CEO of Bay Electric in, uh, Company. And uh, Mr. Maurice Baskin is partner at the law firm of Venable uh, and we, uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are will be sworn in before testimony. So, if you please rise and raise your right hand, just the standard practice of the committee. Do you solemnly swear to affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that each witness answered in the affirmative. And we will start right down the line with uh, um, Mr. Innes. You have about five minutes. You'll get the lighting system, which is in front of your name tag, which we can't see, but you can see. But we have, a, we have a clock up here, too, so but that, no, no big deal. So you have about five minutes if you can uh, keep your testimony close to that. That would be great. And you are recognized. Good afternoon, Chairman Jordan, members of the subcommittee. On behalf of National Federation of Independent Business, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today regarding the impact of project labor agreements have on small businesses. I am the owner and CEO of Venice Electric Company, located in Manassas, Virginia. Ennis Electric was incorporated in 1974 
and for the last 37 years have performed projects in and around the Washington Beltway from $10,000 to $27 million. Many of these projects are with local, state, and federal governments, and we compete. We complete most projects as a subcontractor. Our experience encompasses many special use facilities for both federal and local governments, with a special emphasis on historic renovations and public education facilities. We employ over 120 individuals, many of which have been in our, our employ for years. We strive to foster, foster a loyal workforce by providing a safe, fair, and enjoyable workplace while maintaining the highest possible quality and craftsmanship on our projects to exceed the expectations for our customers. The majority of the work we obtain is through the bid process. Most of these solicitations are awarded to the lowest bidder with varying levels of prequalifications and or technical proposals requiring previous work experience. In the past, these, these solicitations, which are funded by public dollars, have been free from project labor agreements and therefore open to bidders who meet the technical requirements. However, recent Federal policies have changed this practice, making it more and more difficult for small businesses to fairly compete for these contracts. The use of project labor agreements is a discriminatory tactic that prevents non-union construction companies from working on government construction projects. The U.S. Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics found that in an annual report on union membership that from 2009 to 2010, membership fell from 14.5 to 13.1 percent of the U.S. construction workforce. Consider the fact that the construction industry currently has an unemployment rate of over 20 percent. With one-fifth of the workers in the construction industry unemployed, how can Congress acknowledge that PLAs and other regulations only serve as an impediment to job creation? In August 2010, NS Electric made offers to general contractors for three General Service Administration projects in Washington, D.C. These projects were 1800 F Street modernization, the Lafayette Building modernization, and the St. Elizabeth's Adaptive Reuse. Ennis Electric was fully qualified to execute these projects, and our company had more experience than our competition did in performing these particular jobs. Bidding on these types of jobs is a very intensive process for small business, and it can take hundreds of man hours just to prepare an estimate prior to submitting a bid. My company spent 600 hours preparing our bids for these projects. On all three of these projects listed as required by the solicitation, the electrical as, as the electrical contractor for the offer, offerer's non-PLA bid. It later came to our attention that all three of these projects were awarded on the basis that they adhere to project to labor agreements. So despite being fully qualified to do the work, Annis Electric was not selected for the subcontract electrical work because of a project labor agreement. Further, because this change in the solicitation was made retroactive, we lost innumerable man hours that were spent bidding these projects which we were qualified but were considered but not considered because of our non-union status. In this case, the impact of unfair PLA requirement felt by our company will be felt by our company for years. The three aforementioned, aforementioned subcontracts represented over $30 million work over the next several years. As a result, we have been forced to lay off approximately 15 percent of our workforce, and unless we can find other opportunities, we could end up laying over 50 percent of our workforce. The decision to require discriminatory project labor agreements on these three subcontracts could not have come at a more unfavorable time for Ennis Electric and our employees, not to mention the American taxpayers who will have to pay for the increased costs associated with these PLAs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Small Business. Thank you, Mr. Ennis. Ms. Fig. Mr. Chairman, distinguished, distinguished members of the committee, my name is Linda Figg. I am very pleased to be here to represent the members of the Construction Industry Roundtable and to participate in this hearing on the critically important effort to identify the negative impact excessive regulations may have on job growth in our industry. The Roundtable is composed of slightly over 100 CEOs from the leading architectural, engineering and construction firms across the United States. Together, these firms deliver on billions of dollars of public and private sector infrastructure projects that enhance the quality of life for all Americans while directly employing nearly half a million Americans. 
easily double that when considering indirect jobs. As such, we have extensive experience and firsthand knowledge of the challenges and complexities facing the design and construction industry when it comes to navigating the vast regulatory complex that has arisen with respect to our clients' projects. Let me state on the onset that CERT and its members are not opposed to regulations. What we oppose is the inefficiency, redundancy, and overlapping jurisdictional mazes that have come to epitomize excessive regulations. America's can-do spirit, know-how, and innovation still exists. It is just hard to find sometimes under the extensive laws, regulations, and rules that the private sector faces while trying to create jobs that spur economic growth and expansion. The uncertainty and unintended consequences that seems uh, what seems like a never-ending expansion of government's reach really damages the entrepreneurial spirit and desire to take risks, which can help jumpstart a robust economy. When government gives private businesses more freedom, not less, remarkable achievements can be accomplished to enhance prosperity for Americans. In public works infrastructure projects, the Federal Government spends taxpayers' money to put people to work, create economic growth, improve America's global competitiveness, and enhance the quality of life in communities. But oftentimes these projects are subject to time-consuming and often redundant rules which weigh down efficiencies and delivery time while increasing costs. These excessive procedures could be accomplished without necessary, um, unnecessary delays and costs. A good example is the new I-35W bridge replacement. You know, we will all remember the tragic day on August 1, 2007, when the interstate bridge carrying I-35W over the Mississippi River in Minneapolis suddenly collapsed during rush hour traffic, killing 13 and injuring many more. Well, while rescue efforts proceeded, the Minnesota Department of Transportation immediately began a fast-track process of building a new bridge. Three days after the collapse, a request for qualifications was issued for design-build teams interested in the replacement contract, with five teams shortlisted four days later. Technical and price proposals were received on September 14. This is just over a month from the time of the collapse, and evaluated on a best value basis by 27 evaluators from five agencies considering both quality and overall price. The design-build contract was awarded on October the 8th of 2007, just a little over two months after the accident. To allow construction to commence so quickly, the Minnesota Department of Transportation developed strong relationships with permitting agencies. With goodwill and a sense of common mission, the Minnesota Department of Transportation and the agencies agreed to make and keep reasonable commitments. Decisions that normally take months and years had to be made in hours and days. Through this team effort, a project memorandum was issued covering the environmental management issues and permitting the $234 million construction project to move forward. Construction of the new 10-lane interstate bridge proceeded at an accelerated pace, utilizing a local workforce estimated at over 600 tradesmen and laborers, with a 504-foot main span over the Mississippi River erected in just 47 days. On September 18, the new bridge opened to traffic more than three months early. The design and construction of the inter important interstate link that serves 141,000 vehicles per day was completed in just 11 months. This was only possible due to the spirit of cooperation and teamwork between the Minnesota DOT and the permitting agencies to eliminate roadblocks often encountered in the environmental and permitting phase of the project, while still providing a sustainable, eco-friendly bridge that the community is proud of. From notice to proceed with construction to opening to traffic was 339 days. The private sector was given the freedom to enhance the project quality, introduce innovations, and engage the community in selecting some of the bridge's dominant visual features. The bridge highlights innovation with smart bridge technology, 323 sensors that provide long-term valuable information on the bridge. Landscaping provided better drainage, nanotechnology concrete cleans pollution from the air, and LED lighting, a first for highway, cuts the cost of energy and maintenance. But when it came to innovation, these, there was no regulation that told anyone that these things needed to be done. These were choices and benefits that were brought to the project through an open, streamlined process. It was a triumph of a recovery, and our country can have the same recovery. 
The experiences from the new I-35W bridge replacement could be left for just one project, or we can take the heart and, and take to heart the clear, unmistakable lessons we have learned and put them to work across the board on a whole myriad of public projects so that America gets the benefit of efficient, science-based and cost-time sensitive regulations in a manner that gets important infrastructure built while still protecting and caring for our important environment. Private industry, when given more freedom, can achieve amazing results to build a stronger America. It is time to inspire the recharging of the American spirit to help us grow into a strong economy. CERT and its members stand ready to assist the committee in whatever way it can to provide input into possible approaches and methodologies that will apply the streamlining lessons of successful work to a larger scope of Federal projects. I want to close by thanking you, Mr. Chairman, and the other distinguished committee members for your time and attention. Thank you for, um, for giving us some positive news. That is good to hear. We, so often the testimony is not that, but it is good to hear that. That worked so well there. That's what, and you're exactly right. That's what we want to foster in the uh, in the future, uh, Dr. Bellman. Let me thank the distinguished members of the committee for this opportunity to talk uh, about project labor agreements. Project labor agreement is an agreement between a public or private owner, a building trades union or unions, and more frequently construction employers, and the owner assures that the project will be built under union terms and conditions, but not necessarily by union workers, and receives in turn a number of benefits. One is an assurance against strikes or other disruptions of construction activity and typically very close labor management cooperation and informal means of re resolving disputes, an assurance of ready access to appropriately skilled labor within 48 hours of the need. They can and often do obtain concessions from building trade unions with regards to wages, benefits, and working conditions. And PLAs can be used to achieve socially valued goals, such as advancing individuals from low income and disadvantaged groups into construction training programs and into good jobs in the construction industry. Now, PLAs can provide value to owners of construction projects, but that requires choosing the right project, writing the right PLA. Owners need to know what they need from a PLA and how to write the PLA they need. And it is used extensively in the private sector because there is knowledge of this, because it is possible to do this. And we find that Dow Chemical, Toyota, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, Donald Trump use PLAs to obtain value in their construction work. Now, PLAs provide two forms of value, and we need to distinguish these. First of all, there is construction value. This can be, with a well-written PLA on the right project, cheaper to complete on time completion, better quality construction, better safety and health outcomes, and reduced need for oversight by project managers. There is also social value, and this can be provision of superior training and access to jobs, family supporting wages and benefits, adherence to labor and employment law, reduction in medical social costs to the local community, local hire. They can also have possibly negative consequences of excluding nonunion employers, but we will talk about that. Where do we expect to see value from PLAs? In terms of industrial and commercial project, my interviews, I have interviewed more than 200 people, or my, my co-authors have, larger projects, 5 to $10 million is a threshold for industrial and commercial. Projects where completion time is important, projects where skill levels and training are important, projects built under prevailing wage requirements. How do PLAs create value? First of all, direct concessions, change overtime and premium rates, modify apprentice ratios, and so on. There can also be harmonization of working time across trades, changing start times, holidays, flexible scheduling, a number of other steps that increase the efficiency of the utilization of labor. And I should say that these issues face nonunion as well as union contractors in terms of the terms of the trade and how the employees actually expect to be treated. Provision of skilled labor on an expedited basis. There was a big issue in obtaining skilled labor, and it delayed many projects from 2002 to 2007. In fact, it killed a number of private sector projects. And yet a PLA was a good investment in making sure that if you were going ahead with a project, you would have the labor when you need it. Employers do not need to carry excess labor. We can also talk about how PLAs improve communication and cooperation on projects and better coordination in a litigious and 
potentially chaotic industry. The management structures and many of the other parts of the construction industry today make it very hard for construction managers or DCs to actually control the project and get the results they want. PLAs become a tool to improve coordination. The no-strike provision has also allowed numerous PLA projects to continue during local contract disputes. I don't have time right now to talk about whether P how PLAs affect project costs, but would be happy to answer questions on this. I will say that if one reviews uh, studies that meet minimum standards of uh, scholarly quality, the evidence isn't there that PLAs affect project costs. Indeed, most of the work that is cited is bad quality uh, in the sense that it is quite inaccurate. But I would like to talk to the speak to the issue of exclusion and uh, this issue of whether it is a bad thing that non-union contractors are potentially excluded from project labor agreements. A first point is that the controversy, we should be clear, this is not about construction value. This is about social values. This is not about making a project cheaper, making a project come in on time. This is about social values and whether the potential exclusion of part of the labor force is a issue that we should respond to, and it may well be a public policy issue. We need to understand that there are a series of other social values that PLAs advance, such as adherence to labor and employment law in an industry which has a very mixed record on following employment law, that PLAs encourage the provision of training through apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs that they assure the provision of family supporting wages and benefits even for non-union workers on the job, that there is PLAs generally encourage the use of a local labor force so that wages and benefits stay in the local area, and they generally reduce social costs to an area when unbenefited construction workers use free med community medical services. Now, what I am arguing here is that if a social value is that we not exclude non-union workers, from projects, these need to be weighed against the positive social values. That seems legitimate. A second is it is not that hard to write a PLA that includes provisions which make it more possible for nonunion contractors to participate. The Toyota PLA only requires a letter of assent. It allows nonunion contractors to bring current workforce onto the job and paying union-level benefits into their own funds and a trust fund for employees, but they pay union rates. And indeed, Frank Mamet, who was an ABC representative at a conference we had at Michigan State <laughs> University, said that he could see a PLA which nonunion contractors would not have an issue with. I am clearly out of time. I thank you for your uh, patience and look forward to answering thank, your thank, questions. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Biagas. Hi, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to you know, give testimony today. Being the youngest of 14 children, eight boys and six girls from the great state of Louisiana, Lake Charles is where I was born, I have had the opportunity to work in the electrical and, and also general construction field for many years. The trade is one that all the males in the family learn from our father, Alvin B. Agus, who was a master electrician. Most of us learn both on the job and some later served as electrical apprentices trained in the classroom through the IBW Local 861 in Lake Charles, and I served in Local 26 here in Washington, D.C from 1987 to 1991. I am a uh, licensed master electrician in the state of Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., and, and also several other states. In the spirit of the American dream, I purchased Bay Electric Company, Inc. in 1997. Bay is a non-union merit shop and began in business over 47 years ago. The company had revenues of just over $1 million when I bought it, and over the years our team has grown this enterprise roughly over 85 times that size. We have grown the size of our workforce from 18 when I purchased it to over 190 today. Our workforce has 155 field workers, uh, which are licensed electricians, um, apprentices, which are registered in state and federal programs, foremen, laborers, superintendents, office staff of uh, 35 persons, project managers, and so on. Bay performs a large amount of, of work and service work with the Department of Defense, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and you know, all other defense groups, state and local governments, as well as private customers from Maine to Florida and as far west as Louisiana. The projects range in size from $31 million to as small as a $68 service order. 
We perform large-scale, complex electrical projects, which include low-voltage fire alarms, lighting, high voltage up to 35,000 volts, controls, motors, and many electrical tasks. Bay also is a full-service general contractor. And over the last five years, we have performed in excess of $300 million worth of the design, build, and also renovation projects as both prime contractor and also subcontractors for numerous Federal clients, such as USDA, DOD, and Homeland Security. All of the projects that we have done were completed on time and under budget. Bay has a 99.98 on time you know, project completion rate and has never been assessed LDs for late delivery by any Federal, State, or local agency or, or any other private company for that matter. Bay Electric also has a 99.97 percent budget, uh, budget completion rate on budget or, or or actually below budget. Also on safety, Bay has an EMR rate of 0.91, and after our audit this year, we expect that rate is going to go down again. So we are a very safe contractor. As you will find a list of the projects we received, there is a number of projects, and just in the interest of time, I am going to move on. But, you know, we have done projects as large as $31 million. We have done work for BRAC. We have done work at, you know, Belvoir, just about every, you know, every state from Maine to Florida, and certainly continue to do so. Um, the issue I want to discuss with the committee is, is the Executive Order 13502, which encourages project labor agreements on Federal projects, you know, over $25 million, and effectively discriminates against over 85 percent of the construction industry. Unions account for less than 6 percent of the private workforce in Virginia, and over 90 percent of the work, both public and private, is performed by non-union union firms, uh, such as Bay Electric Company. No merit shop contractor would sign a PLA because, among other things, the nonunion workers would have wages, you know, taken out for health plans, welfare, retirement, and also other deductions to which the worker will never see a benefit of and, and will not be vested in these union plans. Union only agreements drive up costs by limited competition, and in Virginia, less than 5 percent of the construction firms are union. These agreements have a chilling effect on the number of firms which would, you know, undertake such bids. Unions also have a huge issue with unfunded pension liabilities, and marriage shop contractors would be crazy to take on such massive liabilities with no benefits to the workers. PLAs also drive up costs by, you know, enforcing inefficient work rules and limited production, hurting morale, and in most cases add numerous man hours to projects and drive up costs, both direct and indirect. With the tenuous state of our economy nationally and the difficult times we are in with real you know, unemployment and construction nearing over 23 percent, can any government entity afford to waste precious funds? As a former union member, it troubles me that unions would want a special deal just for them. When fair competition is a cornerstone of our total you know, economic system, the proponents will also say that the proponents of PLAs will say that labor work stoppages are a benefit to using them. The truth is that there has never been a man hour loss to strikes, picketing, work stoppages, slowdowns, or other disruptive activity on the non union merit side, just the union side. As a former union member, I have witnessed firsthand the tactics used by unions to slow down work, drag out projects for the union benefits. PLA proponents also will say that they, they hope they help to promote fair wages and higher pay. This is also a force. We at Bay Electric pay on average more than unions in wages, benefits, and offer paid, paid vacations, holiday pay, health insurance, and 401K plans. I am going to close because we have got a little more to go between that. But in closing, most of the folks that are actually affected by the PLAs are ethnic minorities whom do not belong to a union and would not have no hope of being employed by union shops as shown in the attached Washington National Stadium studies. Union minority membership rates are horrible, and the union leadership does not uh, represent uh, minorities in any fashion and except for a few token positions at union halls. PLAs on the surface are racist and should not be used or allowed to be adopted in Federal projects. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Piagas. Mr. Baskin. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. of 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Venable. I appear before you today on behalf of the Associated Builders and Contractors. It is a national construction industry trade association representing 23,000 merit shop contractors employing 2 million workers. ABC's members believe that construction contracts should be awarded to the lowest responsible bidder through full and open competition based on merit, with no discrimination based on labor affiliation. These same principles have been written into Federal law. The Competition and Contracting Act requires Federal agencies to award procurement contracts on the basis of full and open competition to the maximum extent practicable, and those are direct quotes from the law. Unfortunately, the Administration's efforts to impose project labor agreements as part of the Federal procurement process threaten to violate the Competition Act at the expense of taxpayers. As we have already heard, according to official government statistics, 87 percent of construction workers currently choose not to belong to any labor unions. And I, I must respond to something said a couple of speakers ago, that uh, exclusion of uh, nonunion contractors is a mere social value. I, I would think that inclusion of 87 percent of the construction workforce is not only a social value and a construction value, it is a fundamental right in our country. Government-mandated PLAs result in the award of Federal construction contracts primarily to the much smaller group of unionized contractors and their union employees. This is special interest favoritism. It is not full and open competition. It is not what the law requires. That is why in 2001 President Bush issued an executive order which was upheld in the courts that prohibited the Federal Government from requiring contractors to enter into project labor agreements. During the eight years of that executive order, there were no significant labor-related problems on any Federal contracts. The buildings did not fall down. Indeed, it was on project labor agreements, some of the most notorious ones, such as the Big Dig, uh, the Iowa Events Center, Miller Park, all project labor agreements that were government mandated, those did fall down, causing fatalities and uh, untold damage. Open competition on the Federal sector under the Bush executive order obviously worked. Nevertheless, with no evidence of any problem, uh, labor-related problems on uh, Federal construction projects, President Obama signed his own executive order in February 2009, which revoked the Bush order that was working and instead encouraged Federal agencies to mandate PLAs on Federal construction projects exceeding $25 million in costs. But the President does not have the authority to override the Competition Act's requirement of full and open competition. There has been no factual justification for the change in policy offered up by any of the government agencies, including those who are uh, in attendance today. We have heard uh, a couple of rationales for it, uh, that it is uh, to avoid strikes. Well, there were no strikes going on on Federal projects. To gain access to uh, a larger pool of labor, tell us how that is possible when you exclude 87 percent of the workforce. Uh, just to name a few of the uh, false rationales that have been offered up uh, in this. That is why ABC members have filed a series of bid protests with the Government Accountability Office to stop unjustified PLA mandates from being imposed by Federal agencies. Through these protests, we have forced a number of agencies to withdraw those mandates. Yet we continue to see threatened PLA requirements showing up on agency procurements around the country, as was confirmed again in Mr. Peck's testimony today that we are going to hear, but that, that we saw on the uh, uh, subcommittee's website. We intend to file a protest against the GSA's new preference policy in favor of PLAs on an upcoming project. That policy has already resulted in a multi-million dollar increase in the cost of construction on a project awarded here in the District of Columbia that Mr. Ennis's company was excluded from, and GSA should be required to make public the price comparisons between PLA and non-PLA bids on each of the projects listed in Mr. Peck's testimony. Many independent studies, scholarly ones, I might add, have found that PLAs increase the cost of construction by as much as 18 percent. In fact, studies commissioned by the Federal Government have found that. Studies commissioned by State governments have found cost increases from PLAs. The Government mandates of PLAs will therefore result in reduced job creation within the construction industry at a time when we have this staggering 22 percent unemployment figure. They hurt small businesses, particularly subcontractors. They 
discriminate against minorities and women-owned businesses, which are overwhelmingly non-union. They do nothing to increase or stabilize construction employee wages, which I also heard referred to today, because the Davis-Bacon Act already protects construction industry wages at a, a very high rate. Uh, I will refer uh, the rest of my remarks, given I have run out of time, uh, that is in my written testimony, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. No, thank you, Mr. Baskin. We appreciate all, all, all our witnesses' testimony. Mr. Biagas, you, you just want to compete, right, on a, on a fair, what did you say, you had 13 siblings, something like that? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so you learned a little I learned at a young age, yeah. being the youngest, that, that I needed to compete. Youngest of four, so uh, yeah. you definitely know how to compete. You just want to compete. Now, Mr. Bellman and Mr. Baskin did some of this. Uh, Dr. Bellman had talked about PLAs uh, and in, in the advantage there, but you don't have a problem with your workers striking, is that right? No, sir. No work stoppages, no picketing? Never had. Mr. Mr. Ennis, you ever had that problem? No, so I mean the idea that that is in a PLA agreement is, is not really a point. Uh, and, and what about your, you have training programs and apprentice programs for your employees, I assume? Yes, sir, full fledged. Thir yeah. 30 apprentices are training now, four year program, 788 hours in the classroom, over 8,000 on the job training. Recognizing and giving the thumbs up by the, uh, the, uh, the regulatory agency? EOL, yes, no, sir. Imagine EOL, that. that and Mr. Mr. Ennis, is that the same with you? Oh yes, sir. Yeah, I mean the way they do it. Four-year apprenticeship, and it's registered by the state of Virginia. Yeah, the way they do it in Ohio is we work closely with our vocational schools. It's a big element in our in our joint vocational schools and, and, and programs. I've been out to see it. I've actually spoke at many of their banquets. I mean, they, they do a great job, and these these kids they all get placed, and they 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 do a great job for for several of the companies that I have the privilege of uh, of representing in Ohio. Uh, so we, we appreciate that. Now, I want to get right to the agreement, and then I want to try to yield some time. We have some members who have really been on this issue, like Mr. Genta from New Hampshire. I want to try to yield some time to him. But let me just ask you this. I want to understand how this works. We understand GSA, and, and they are going to be on the next panel, they give a kind of a 10 percent bonus criteria to, uh, to PLA agreements. So is it, is it, is it this simple? If, if you do a bid, Mr. Ennis, on a, on, a, on a public project, and let's say your bid is $91, and the, 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 the union uh, shop of the PLA group comes in at $100, um, thereby, and they get that 10 percent bonus, so they are really at 90, do they get the bid <clears throat> on that basis alone, or do we not know that? We do not know that. And this is to your point, Mr. Baskin. We, we want to know why, exactly? Yes. Okay. That's the it's fundamental. actually worse than that because they say it is not based on a price. One, could, one price could be lower than the other. The nonunion price could be lower, but they are just going to give this extra bump on the technical phase of the PLA. Well, that is my point. You, the, Mr. Innes's bid comes in at 91. Let us say their bid comes in at 100, but they get some 10 percent bonus. We don't know how that is applied. So they could apply it just on the dollars and say 10 percent less. Well, they are they're actually 90, so now we are going to award the bid based on that. It is actually costing the taxpayers more money then because it is still 100. Correct. Okay. Okay. I want to. I want to make sure I understand. I want to yield time to the first, the, the chairman of the committee, and then uh, if we have a, uh, I got two and a half minutes. If we have time, I want to get Mr. Ginter rolling too because he had the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not going to take any time except to thank you for looking into what is undoubtedly costing the American taxpayers an opportunity to have better roads, better bridges, or at least more of them. So uh, I have nothing else at this time. But I truly appreciate your attention. Yield back. I'm going to yield two minutes, two minutes and 15 seconds to the, to the gentleman from New Hampshire who has been working this issue very hard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in full disclosure, I support and propose an amendment to ban PLAs, and I want the witnesses to, to know that before we start this commentary. Um, I, I personally feel that PLAs, based on the uh, estimates that I have seen uh, in, in 2008 alone, have cost taxpayers somewhere around $2.6, $2.8 billion. In an era when we have to find and do more with less, and in an era where we have a budget crisis, and I believe it is a crisis, uh, where we have a $1.6 trillion deficit and a $14 trillion debt, um, I think it is incumbent upon us and the country expects it is incumbent upon us to really navigate through these issues and find a better way to invest in our country, improve in our country. Uh, and I find it disheartening that we would, as a PLA does, give greater access to one group and not another. And that is really the substance of the frustration that I have with this issue. Um, I wouldn't say that asking for equality is anti-union or pro-small uh, business. I think it is an equity and fairness issue. And I have heard from every small business owner who is non-union 
that they would like to do nothing but compete. And I heard you, Mr. Biagas, say that. Yes. Um, and I think that that would be better for the market, better for the project, better for the consumer, better for the taxpayer, and, and I would argue better for both the union and a non-union shop. Um, so with that in mind, um, I can certainly stay for some, some questioning later. Uh, I would like to get to the crux of why there is this assumption that a union must have uh, an advantage over a non-union shop. That is a question that I think uh, deserves to be answered, and the American public deserves uh, a recognition and understanding of that and its correlation to the cost uh, of PLAs uh, in this country. I yield back. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now recognize the distinguished ranking member from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the witnesses claimed that PLAs were racist. That is a pretty serious charge, and so I asked uh, staff to look at the Federal cases to see if there are any cases that have been filed on this question that relates uh, to whether or not people are, uh, people's 14th Amendment protections are being violated. And I didn't intend to bring this up, but I just asked staff to come back with it. And what they came back with was a case out of the United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Ninth District that, uh, where the defendants included the uh, IBEW Local 441, the Construction Trades Council. Uh, of Los Angeles and Orange County's Building and Construction Trade Council. And the findings, uh, substantive and procedural due process claims, here is what the Court said, the, the Court of Appeals, the plaintiffs contend that the PSA, they call them PSAs, they violated their rights to substantive and procedural due process by depriving them of liberty and property interests protected by the 14th Amendment. And the Court says we conclude that plaintiffs cannot make this threshold showing. So. Um, I just wanted to submit this for the record. No objection. When you say racist, you better be able to back it up. Also, Mr. Chairman, I would like a yes or no answer from uh, Dr. Bellman. Uh, did you say that these project uh, labor agreements uh, cover both public and private uh, jobs? Yes, yes or no? Yes. And yes or no, Ms. Fague, did you say uh, when you were talking about that bridge project in Minnesota? Was that done by a project? Was there a project labor agreement involved in that bridge project? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now, um, Dr. Bellman, you've heard the testimony of several individuals and associations from the construction industry claiming that Federal agencies' use of PLAs will negatively impact competition and drive up construction costs. As you know, Executive Order 13502 focuses on large scale construction projects where the total cost of the Federal Government is $25 million or more and which are generally more complex and of longer duration. Can you tell us how competition among bidders for these types of large construction projects impact cost? Yes. There, there actually is very limited careful research on this. But what is clearance and work done by a colleague of mine, Professor Peter Phillips of Utah, suggests that on large projects, Having three to four bidders is more than enough to get very close to minimum cost because the gains from winning a bid are so large that employer bidders want to make sure that they get it. Smaller projects, one is more willing to roll the dice, kind of a Las Vegas approach to construction contracting, because if you can get if you put in a high bid but you still win, you make a lot of money. You so the bottom line is that it's not clear that the that you need to get huge numbers of contractors on a job for the public to get the low price and the well, low you, bid on if a you job. Found, if you found that PLAs have a negative impact on competition for contracts? Um, I haven't researched that question. Okay. In his written testimony, Mr. Ennis expressed concern regarding the government's insistence that all government contracts of a certain size must use union labor, despite shrinking levels of union membership. Now, Dr. Bellman, based on your research and familiarity with various project labor agreements, do PLAs prevent nonunion contractors from being included in large Federal construction projects? 
It depends on the PLA. I know I am aware of Federal PLAs that are fairly open, and the most recent ones so are. Some, so yeah. some are open. They, they don't prevent right. them. No, they do not prevent them, nor do they impose undue burdens on them. Some of the other witnesses, yeah. Dr. Bellman, uh, have claimed that requiring the use of PLAs for Federal construction projects increases the cost to taxpayers. Now, in fact, some reports have supported this claim that PLAs increase the cost of construction. Your research, however, suggests these concerns are overstated. What about this discrepancy? There is considerable anecdotal evidence. You can find projects where PLAs were more expensive. You can find example case studies of projects where PLA were less expensive. In terms of careful research, what I would say is there's, there are two uh, peer-reviewed studies, one by Beacon Hill that suggests that uh, PLAs increase project costs in Massachusetts schools by about 12 percent, 14 percent. My own work in industrial relations, which takes a much closer look at this and allows for the differences, you don't use PLAs on a plain vanilla school. You use them okay. on a more okay. complex I, school, no, pro, no costs. Final question. Okay. Uh, you don't contend that PLAs should be used on every single large-scale construction project. Is that correct? No. Okay. Uh, you, no, no meaning what? No means right project, right PLA, then they make sense to you. Okay. Thank the gentleman. We will now yield to the Vice Chairman, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. Uh, this Congress is, uh, m has made the economy and job creation our number one priority uh, as this Nation has faced 20-plus months of unemployment at 9 percent or above. So to you all in the panel who are the job creators, thank you. And we look forward to working with you to create an environment where you can create jobs and you can be successful and the government isn't in the way of your progress and your success. So thanks for being here today. Um, my first question is to Mr. Biagas, um, and I might say to you, my chief of staff is the oldest of 14, <laughs> so you, you two have a lot in common, or not so. <laughs> I want to uh, give you the opportunity, because the uh, allegation and, and what you stated in your statement is a serious one, and maybe you could cite for us some specific examples. Yes, ma'am. In the attachment, the handout I had, there was a study that was done on the Washington National Stadium, which had a PLA, and it also had goals and also hard goals for hiring of, of inner city and minorities that actually reside in the District of Columbia. Uh, due to the, the, the way the work actually went, that was never fulfilled. I would further say, if you would look into that study, you would certainly find that there was an obvious attempt not to hire these inner city minorities which the intent or the bill of goods that was sold with the PLA was they were going to hire a bunch of inner city youth and or folks and put them through the apprenticeship to let them become, you know, trades workers. It did not happen, nor does it ever happen on PLAs. It is all smoke and mirrors. Thank you very much. May I supplement that sure, response? It goes to your question as well as to uh, Congressman Kucinich. Uh, in Chicago, uh, African American and female construction workers were awarded $1.3 million under a consent decree arising out of a PLA project asking for cases of racism. And on, uh, in Alameda County, jury awarded a black construction worker $490,000 for racial harassment on the PLA San Francisco Airport project. Uh, the Philadelphia City Council found that uh, minority standards were not being met under PLAs in that city. The Mayor of Buffalo, New York, uh, made similar criticisms in the Washington National Stadium already referenced to. These and other uh, specific incidents of racism and racist problems and minorities and women under PLAs uh, are set forth in our report on uh, the poor perform performance of PLAs. A uh, new edition is coming out, and I will be happy to provide that to the committee. Thank you very much. My next question is to Ms. Fig, um, because when you were asked the yes or no question regarding the PLA project for the bridge, the I-35 bridge, I think I had the feeling you wanted to explain that. But my understanding is you are here to talk to us about regulations, and that is what this subcommittee is about. So perhaps you could just uh, give us, first of all, it is encouraging to know that a project with that, of that magnitude could be accomplished in that short a period of time. Had, had that not been on the fast track, can you give us some estimate of of the cost and what it would have cost uh, with the standard operating procedure, as well as the length of time? Well, there, are some, um, there is some information that would suggest that a project like that um, would take anywhere from 10 to 15 years to bring to 
um, actual construction. Um, the processes um, are overlapping in that both State and Federal governments require the same things, um, but there is no, um, uh, you know, working together on those. And so you have to go through these review processes. You know, private industry knows what the regulations are, and so they put forth a proposal that accomplishes meeting those. It is the review process that takes so long to just confirm that, in fact, what you put forward it was meeting the criteria. So we see many times where you submit information for an environmental process, for instance, and it goes on for a number of years, but the project doesn't change from the day you submitted the original proposal. So it is just uh, it, it's a time waster. And there's indications that there is at least a 10 percent additional cost in, uh, and more. Some have indicated in our construction industry roundtable sentiment indexes up to 50 percent of additional cost due to these um, overlapping regulations. Thank you. Mr. Ennis, uh, just briefly, you mentioned in your opening statement that you bid on three jobs and you, were not, uh, you did not successfully uh, get any of those jobs. Can you just tell us um, if you received any feedback as to why you didn't get the contract? Because they were awarded as PLAs. Two, two of the three were actually, one was awarded as a PLA and a, sub a subsequent change order was issued a couple million dollars to make it PLA. We were asked on one of the projects to sign a PLA. Um, the third project, from what I understand, they never could come to an agreement on a PLA, and I think I believe they withdrew it. All three of these proposals are technical proposals of which any of that information was never available to us. But with the contractors that we bid with, we were told, you know, we are out because we would not sign a PLA. Thank you. And I am out of time, but just quickly, was the uh, shop that was awarded to a union shop or a non-union shop? To a union shop. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank the gentlelady. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses. Obviously, a lot of scar tissue is built up on this issue. It seemed like under the George H. W. Bush administration, project labor agreements were banned. And under Clinton, they were encouraged. And under George W. Bush, they were banned again. Now under Obama, they are encouraged. So we have gone back and forth, back and forth. And I know um, Mr. Baskin is a professional you know, at figuring this stuff out, but it strikes me as odd that in a couple of panels of sworn witnesses here, we have such a completely different understanding of the facts. It is almost hard to imagine we could have such a different impression, because on the face of the executive order, it says that executive agencies may require these things. It doesn't say they have to. And then in the next panel, um, Mr. Gordon is going to testify, I believe. I don't want to jump the gun here. That He says on page 5, any contractor may compete for and win a Federal contract requiring a project labor agreement whether or not the contractor's employees are represented by a labor union. Then he goes on to describe a lot of other flexible provisions that these may contain because these are, have to be negotiated. And so it's kind of hard for me to understand who's telling the truth here. You know, here from many panelists, we're here gloom and doom. From the other side, we're here flexibility. Who, I don't have a dog in this fight. Who am I supposed to believe? You know, it just depends on, you know, previous scar tissue or previous experience or, and as I say, you're all, all sworn witnesses. You know, how do you reconcile this conflict? Mr. Baskin, I'll give sure. you an opportunity. Since Glad to respond. Uh, because a known I think, professional in this, this area. I, I think we have some agreement on this panel, which is uh, that Dr. Bellman has conceded that uh, PLAs generally do exclude the non-union contractors, and it's a totally false premise to say, well, they can bid. They just can't perform the work unless well, they agree to sir, become Dr. Union Bellman contractors. is shaking his head, so you may have spoken. Well, Dr. Bellman speak for himself, and as will his previous testimony. But uh, the uh, what you asked about the executive orders, uh, President Bush's was the first uh, executive order to clearly uh, prohibit, but also stay neutral on the issue. Which President Bush? Uh, President Bush. Uh, 
George W. Bush. Uh, President Clinton did not issue an executive order. His father had also prohibited project labor agreements, according at, to Dr. Bellman. At the very end of his administration, when there were no, uh, <laughs> there was not time to implement it. Then, but he had still done that. His father had done it. And then President Clinton came in with a, did not issue an executive order, merely a memorandum. I guess the point about the current executive order, let's talk about the present day. It says they shall encourage agencies to require. And under what right do, do, should any agency be able to require a restrictive bid specification, which is what a PLA is, that reduces competition? That is really what this is all about. All we are asking for is full and open competition in a meaningful way without the restrictive bid specifications. I am sure you would be interested in litigating that. If we already fee, have been. A fee involved. Uh, well, yeah. our, we already have. It is regrettable that money has to be spent on litigating something that was already in the Competition and Contracting Act. But we have brought four protests that have all been successful, I think, because the agencies have recognized that there is an overreach involved here. But how about this direct statement that any contractor may enter into a PLA whether or not a contractor's employees are represented by a labor union? And because of the discriminatory aspects of telling, what, what are you doing there? You are telling a nonunion contractor to completely revamp his way of doing business, that which has made him successful and would make the government successful well, if no. he used his services, certainly, to, to accept well, union representation for employees who don't want it. Dr. I, Bellman? Uh, one, you can write PLAs many different ways. To be private sector PLAs often do require that a contractor be signatory, permanent signatory to a local agreement. I haven't done a thorough enough study of public PLAs to know where they stand, but they are certainly moving towards greater openness to nonunion contractors, to drag along clauses, and to dealing with benefit issues. Do you think it's but I will say, I do have to say, is that while open competition is important, the point of the open competition is to provide public with value. And there are projects and there, that public value can be increased through the use of project labor agreements. And I am not sure that it is wise to come up with a policy that would prevent the public from realizing that value. My time is expiring. It seems to me that a good lawyer could write a good PLA. Many have. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Gintz, is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the point that I would make is, why does a good lawyer have to write a good PLA? Uh, Mr. Baskin, if your preference uh, would be, I assume, not to have to engage in writing a PLA, correct? Uh, yes, but it's not just me. We are talking thousands of contractors around the country have voiced their opposition to being forced to change their way of doing business and to force unions on employees who work for them who don't want it. They're, have a vote if that's what the unions want. Why are they being subjected to this? It's about them. It's not about me. And secondly, if 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 uh, this executive order was not in place, you or any other lawyer wouldn't have to sue for a fee. That's correct? absolutely right. Correct. Okay. okay. Now, <clears throat> um, I think we all know what the definition of require is, and I just want to read section three of the executive order thirty five uh, thirteen five zero two. Um, and, and, if, and if I'm not reading this correctly, I'd like someone to, to correct me, please. It states, in awarding any contract in connection with a large-scale construction project or obligating funds pursuant to such a contract, executive agencies may, on a project-by-project -project basis, require the use of a project layer, labor agreement by a contractor. <clears throat> so what it says to me is a very clear suggestion that you should require project labor agreements. Now, technically, under the law, the word may covers the fact that you don't have to. But what I would like to know is how many, um, of, the, how many of these projects do not require a project labor agreement. Does anyone, would, would Dr. Bellman, would you know the answer to that question? I haven't studied uh, that in terms of Federal contracts recently. Uh, you had testified earlier, and, and I'd like to hear about this a little bit more. I apologize. I had to step out of the room. But you talked about value. And can you just talk to me a little bit more about the, the social value that you are referring to? 
Okay. Well, let me give you an example. On the West Coast, uh, there are a number of project labor agreements that contain very extensive provisions for moving individuals in low-income areas or from uh, minority groups through pre-apprenticeship training programs into apprenticeship programs and then into uh, full journeyman status. Now, re having re and there are extensive systems of community overview. There are extensive joint panels that make sure that these are effective, and every review I have read suggests that they are extremely effective in moving particularly African Americans and Hispanics into well-paid, highly trained jobs where they are very productive uh, members of the workforce. So that is a po I interpret that as a positive social value that can be generated by PLAs and isn't generated in their absence. So am I to assume, based on, on that described value, that non-union companies do not engage in apprenticeships with minorities? What I would tell you is that, from my own research and, and that of Jahan Bilgins and a number of others, is that there is, and also you can read in the uh, engineering news record and from the Construction Users Roundtable, is that there is a crisis in construction training, that there is underinvestment in construction training, and that is largely on the nonunion side. Can we find good nonunion construction companies? You bet. Are there nonunion construction companies that will go out there, compete for, for uh, PLA work, get the contracts and do well? You bet. But on average, Non-union companies are much more dependent on public training contributions and provide much less training than do union uh, construction firms. Uh, well, the testimony that I heard from Mr. Ennis and Mr. Biagas would would refute that that last statement you made. No, they don't. They simply say, as I said, there are some great companies, non-union companies out there that do very well, but. The typical non-union company does much less training and invests much less in training than a union company. Just like, uh, contrary to some of the things that are said here, there is African Americans make up a smaller percentage of the non-union workforce today than they do the union workforce. So if you hire a union company, you are more likely to have an African American worker on the job than if you hire a non-union so company. Should, so, then, so based on that argument, we should apply this standard to every industry in the country? Which standard? The, the, the requirement that unions participate in any, in, any, in any industry, not just the construction industry, because unions, according to what you are saying, spend more time training. Yet the, the, the rest of the um, free market society would suggest otherwise. There, it, uh, you can look at Peter Capelli's work on this, and there is a strong suggestion that the U.S. spends considerably less on employee training than do most other industrialized countries, and that is a reason why our economy is not functioning as well as we would like. Whether unions are the solution to this, I have to be neutral on, but I do know that in construction, unions and their signatory employers, and I shouldn't make that point, these are through joint labor management committees, spend far more on training through private means than does the non-union sector, and that in many times the non-union sector is dependent on their, for their most skilled workers on people who have left the union sector, people like, Ms., to some degree, like Mr. Biagis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now recognize the gentlelady, Ms. Beyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and thank you for holding this hearing. Let me uh, first request unanimous consent that uh, two statements be submitted for the record by Tammy Miser and Catherine Rylett. Without objection. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of points. Uh, I, I think this is just a fascinating discussion because, as um, Mr. Cooper had said, um, it seems like we are talking over each other and um, not necessarily getting much clarity. The project labor agreement that Toyota has um, embraced is one that is worth um, spelling out a little bit. And Jeff Caldwell said, as the former head of the construction for Toyota North America, I have had numerous real-world experiences with PLAs. 
and I can say without any equivocation that they are valuable tools for any entity seeking an economical and efficient construction process. Toyota has constructed numerous automobile, truck, and engine production facilities in the United States. Each of these co construction projects was completed or is being completed under a project labor agreement that ensures that our facilities were built with steady supply of high skilled and productive workers. In every instance, and I underscore this, this process worked beautifully, and the proof is in the results. Toyota North American construction costs are roughly one-third less than other major automobile manufacturers who eschew the use of project labor agreements. Now, a big point is being made that somehow the government, under the executive order by President Obama, is forcing these PLAs by various Federal agencies. Mr. Baskin has made that point over and over again. But let me point out, um, in an article that just appeared, nine workers were detained in a raid at a VA hospital job site in Florida. These nine people are in the United States illegally, were found to be working on the construction of a new Federal, Federal Veterans Administration hospital in Orlando, Florida. It is estimated cost of over $600 million um, that the VA project represents. VA has strongly opposed doing PL, um, <coughs> PLAs. And uh, so on the one hand, we have some Federal agencies that are not interested in doing PLAs. We have an example where one was clearly not using a PLA, and they have got nine workers who have been detained because they are illegal and working in this country. I am sure there are jobs that um, American workers would love to have. Uh, let me just um, speak a little bit about uh, Tammy Miser, who is the sister of a, a man that was um, burned to death in a, uh, in a, at a job site in uh, this country. Uh, it was a company that um, did not follow the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazards Investi Investigation Board's recommendations relative to dust collectors. Um, and the CSB concluded that had the company adhered to the National Fire Protection Association standard for combustible metal dust, the explosion would have been minimized or prevented altogether. Uh, I guess my question is to you, Dr. Bellman. Do you think that we have a, a productive discussion today about um, the impact of OSHA regulations without involving uh, stories like the worker who lost his life? Uh, any uh, economist would say if you are going to take a look at regulations, you need to look at the benefits as well as the costs. One could, of course, look at purely the costs of building a containment vessel on a nuclear reactor and, include, and conclude they are a bad idea. But every now and then their benefits are very great. So you need to look at the benefits of regulation, fewer lives lost and so on, as well as their costs. Thank you. I think my time is expired. I, I, I thank the gentleman. Mr. Bellman, uh, the OSHA deciding to back off the noise um, uh, regulation that they were initially talking about relative to um, uh, machines in, in manufacturing facilities. Um, do you think that was a good move? Do you think that they, they heard that in this situation that the, what, what perceived benefit was uh, not there and that it was a cost issue? Although, as an academic, I believe I know all things, I don't have enough information to answer that question, okay. yes I or no. I appreciate it. I recognize the gentleman from, uh, from Iowa, Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me begin by stating that I strongly support project labor agreements, and apparently the bipartisan majority of the House of Representatives does as well, because recently during the uh, debate on the job-killing spending bill that we passed, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle attempted to end all PLAs on public construction sites across the country, and that amendment failed on a tie vote in the House. And if you do the math, you realize that would not have passed or would have not been prevented without Republican support and opposition to that amendment. PLAs play an important role for economic development in Iowa and across the country. They provide good paying jobs for hardworking Americans. And now they are under attack, not just here, but also in my state. The truth is that PLAs have proven to be very cost effective. In the 1990s in Dubuque, Iowa, the local building trades council negotiated private sector PLAs for nine sites, and four of these sites were for the DePaco Community Credit Union. These projects were completed ahead of schedule and under budget, and one of them is shown up on the screen. 
The President and CEO of DuPaco stated that building construction exceeded our expectation because it was finished 30 days ahead of schedule and 10 percent under budget. I have a list here of 280 PLA projects in the Quad Cities that were completed either on time or ahead of schedule. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter them into the record. These projects include the Putnam Museum in Davenport, the St. Ambrose University Science Library, the Palmer Chiropractic College, and just recently, our Governor, Terry Branstead, issued an executive order banning PLAs on public works projects in Iowa, including an existing PLA in Cedar Rapids for the Cedar Rapids Convention Center, a city that was devastated by flooding two years ago when its entire downtown was underwater. Ironically, Mr. Chairman, the number one supporter for this PLA project moving forward is the current mayor of Cedar Rapids, Ron Corbett, who used to be the Republican leader of our State Senate. After the executive order was issued, Mayor Corbett asked the governor to consider using $15 million from a State Jobs Fund to finish the project, but our governor refused the mayor's request, and as a result, this enormously important economic development project is now on hold. Putting a work stoppage on this project is harmful to Cedar Rapids community and to Iowa. And if PLAs are banned in Congress, what is happening in Cedar Rapids will happen all over the country. That is why I urge my college to, colleagues to continue opposing any efforts to, to uh, end PLA funding. And now I want to talk about that PLA on the bridge in Minneapolis, which I happen to have in my hand. One thing we know is that this project finished early and under budget. That is correct, isn't it, Ms. Big? It was completed under a PLA in only 11 months and for less than the $250 million earmarked by Congress. And the Transportation Secretary, Mary Peters, said it should not take a tragedy to build a bridge this fast in America. And I should point out this PLA was entered into when George W. Bush was President. Isn't that correct? So. Then, uh, Mr. Baskin, um, you brought up something I want to talk about, and I, you went off script in your opening, so I wasn't prepared for this, but you mentioned the Iowa Events Center, something I happen to know a great deal about. You said, when referring to these building projects, those did fall down, causing fatalities and untold damages. Do you remember saying that? Yes. In fact, the Iowa Events Center did not fall down, did it? Only a large crane which killed a construction worker. When the events center did not fall down, did it? Uh, part of the construction did, yes. Well, well semantics. It, it, the center, it, it, the building it certainly itself. the building itself never fell down. And tragically, one worker, a 65 year old steel erector, was killed. And we know that on massive construction projects of this side, regrettably, fatalities are not uncommon whether or not they are union contractors. Isn't that true? Yes, we will agree that the safety level and you, union non union is roughly the same. And so one of the things that you talk about is the challenges that your group has filed to these PLAs. In fact, you filed a challenge in Iowa on that event center project, and the Iowa Supreme Court, in a 6 to 1 decision, upheld the right of that PLA to move forward, even though my state is a right to work state. Isn't that true? Well, I didn't. The local chapter did. I won't. The local chapter of the group you are here testifying on behalf of today filed that suit. It went all the way to our Supreme Court, and they upheld this PLA. Right. And as a result, there were cost overruns, construction defects, nearly 50 construction accidents, and uh, I, it was not a model project. There have uh, been uh, papers written on just that project and the problems that happened with it. And it is your, your testimony today, then, on, on massive uh, construction projects built by non-union contractors, those problems you identified have never occurred? No, but the, okay. but the, the, the sorry, reason Mr. is Chairman, we are, the burden is on, the, and if I may I'm respond, the finish. burden is on those who are seeking to uh, discriminate. And the justification has been that PLAs are better somehow and that PLAs don't have safety problems and that they don't have delays and we, all the things we just heard. And that is simply not the case. They do have these problems and then some. And so then what is the justification for discrimination which they unquestionably have? And that is our only point. And we are only talking about government-mandated PLAs. We are not uh, concerned here today with private, if what the private sector wants to do with their own money is for them to decide. Sometimes it is under coercion. We are not arguing about that. And so is it your testimony today that the ABC is not opposed to private PLAs? We are not. Uh, we, we stand for the proposition that 
private employers can decide how to spend their own money. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, quickly recognize the ranking member, and then I want to get to the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, for unanimous consent, a, uh, to submit it to the record from the Campaign for Quality Construction, uh, testimony that says PLA do not discriminate against nonunion contractors and workers. Well, uh, uh, without objection, it would be entered. But, but, I mean, we come back to this point, and Mr. Cooper raised this, too. When the President of the United States tells the agencies they may require that is not just any old citizen telling you know, uh, how an agency is going to make a decision. So this idea that somehow that is neutral, uh, I, just, I just don't think, think people buy that, buy that concept. Um, the, the, the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman. Mr. Bellman, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bellman, let me ask you this. In my district, we have got um, some situations where I, I would guarantee you that African-American male unemployment is like 65 percent. And I assume that a PLA would be helpful there, you think? A properly designed PLA that was sufficiently large could be used to move uh, disadvantaged men and women through various stages of training to much better jobs than they currently fill. And what happens so often in these neighborhoods is that folk come in and they do work right in front of their houses, and they are sitting on the sidelines not having an opportunity to work. They come from everywhere. I see it, I see it all the time. And so a PLA, I take it, you could have provisions in there that would help with regard to training so that they would be given an opportunity to use their tax dollars to take care of their families, learn a trade, or, and then move forward in life. Has that been your testimony? In point of fact, most of the West Coast Port and other PLAs which have these training programs also have an effective local hire provision, which sets very clear goals for movement through pre-apprenticeship into apprenticeship programs are pretty thoroughly reviewed, and there is oversight by community groups as well as by employers, the ports or other owner organizations in the building trades. And the reports that I have read and people I have talked to have indicated they have been very effective uh, in this. And PLAs have an advantage over any other training program uh, because they are connected. One problem with uh, governments supported training programs is that they tend not to be connected to jobs at the end. You train people, they come out, there is not a job. For most of the PLA work, there is a job and there is a clear advancement, as I said, pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship, and then into journeyman status and, you know, a relatively high wage and solid benefits. So in other words, these folks get an opportunity to participate in a process that then opens the door for opportunity. In other words, it is like a, an engagement and then hopefully a marriage. Yes, because the pre-apprenticeship programs in particular tend to turn, you know, there are people who are, this is the perfect job for, there are people who don't like working outside. If you are going to be a construction worker, some, you know, how, Figuring out whether you want to work outside is very good before we invest a lot of money in training. But that is very important. So it is not a guarantee simply because you show up that you are going to end up in a wonderful career. But for the right person, it opens up opportunities that otherwise don't seem to exist. And so when you have, for example, the African American unemployment rate consistently, consistently, almost double the general unemployment rate, and if you are talking about creation of jobs, and you are talking about long-term jobs, and you are not just talking about jobs, but you are talking about careers, and you are talking about people contributing back into society, PLA may not be a bad idea if it is structured right and if it has the proper oversight. Is that right? Is that a reasonable statement? That is very reasonable. An example would be the San Jose school system, which used the PLA as a basis for establishing a construction academy. They were rebuilding a high school. 
and it has been very successful. And indeed, the Construction Academy and the linkage from high school students taking courses and then doing internships over the summer and having privileged access to apprenticeship opportunities has continued even though the PLA has expired. And indeed, the construction industry is so enthused about getting very good students and into white collar as well as blue collar jobs that they have now started a training program for high school math teachers so they can take their experiences in construction back to the classroom and encourage better students to think about construction careers. So it is about opportunity? Yes. And it be, I will yield back. I think the gentleman, we do have to get to it. But one of the things I, I want to, one, one last question, and it may be better for the second panel, but Mr. Biagas, I believe, mentioned in his testimony only 6 percent of the construction firms in Virginia, maybe it is Northern Virginia, are union firms. Is that right, Mr. Biagas? Yes, sir. And do we have any data on what percentage of Federal uh, projects are awarded to, what is the percentage awarded to union and non union? Do we, do we have any of that data? I mean, to me, that seems to be the central question. If it is 6 percent are only 6 percent are union, if they are getting the vast majority of the contracts, then, then that shows you how skewed the system is. Do we have any of that data? I don't have the data with me, Congressman. Mr. Bellman? Uh, I mean, we are going to ask GSA no, I, in the next and, panel. But. And I would be fascinated to learn. Yeah, no, wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? It's a moving target because the PLA program has not been fully implemented yet. We are fighting as hard as we can to stop it, and we are calling for help from Congress. I understand that. Thank you all very much. We have to adjourn and, uh, for, uh, for a vote on the floor, or recess, excuse me, for a vote on the floor. Good job.